In this chapter 7 series of lectures, I will teach you guys about the periodic properties of elements. I want to start by telling you guys a quick story. As I often do, last year when I was teaching my chemistry students, I uh, finished a section by saying, um, please ask me, students, if you guys have any questions. Now, I had one student who was kind of being a little bit of a smart aleck and said, okay, Mike, do we have any questions? <laughs> well, basically, he's just given me what I asked for. I thought for a moment, and I said, uh, you know, I was thinking, how do I respond to this? So I responded what I thought was a genius way. I looked at that student, and I said, no student, you understand everything I taught you perfectly. After today's lecture, which will cover sections one through four from chapter seven of our text, you guys should be able to do the following. Appreciate the history of the periodic table. It's a wonderful history. Describe and calculate the effective nuclear charge, also known as Z effective or ZEF. And know the periodic table uh, trends in atoms and ion sizes and use them to sort examples. Let's begin. I love the synopsis given in section 7.1 of our text on how the periodic table was developed. I will not cover it in class or in this lecture video or ask any questions about it on exams or problem sets, but I think it's really cool. So for my students who are in my class, you guys have the text, I invite you to read it. For any of you guys out there just watching this on YouTube, I invite you to look up something about the history of the periodic table because it's really, really neat. Well, that said, we'll now move on to the first topic, Z effective or ZEF. So you guys should definitely know by now that electrons have negative charges while protons have positive charges. Protons, of course, reside in an atom's nucleus, while electrons uh, orbit, in some manner of speaking, uh, around the nucleus in the orbitals that we discussed in our Chapter 6 lectures. So with that said, it makes sense that every electron orbiting around the nucleus feels an attraction to the protons that are in the nucleus. But at the same time, they also feel some degree of repulsion from the other electrons that are uh, around them and between them and the nucleus. Because electrons all have negative charges and negative charges repel each other, just like in magnets. For instance, the outermost electron here in this make-believe atom that I've shown here would feel attracted to the protons in this nucleus, but it would also feel repulsed by the other electrons in these innermost shells that are in between the outermost electron and these protons. So we can say then that these in-between electrons shield the outermost electron from the protons in the nucleus. This makes it so the outermost electron doesn't feel the protons in the nucleus and their uh, contingent attraction as strongly as it otherwise would if uh, it didn't have these darn electrons in between it and those protons. So obviously, inner electrons feel the pull from the nuclear protons more strongly than outer shell electrons. The strength of attraction between an electron and the protons in its atom's nucleus is called its effective nuclear charge, or Z effective, which is sometimes abbreviated as ZEFF, and I sometimes just call it ZEF. So Z effective can be calculated mathematically using this equation. ZEF equals Z minus S, where Z is the number of protons in the nucleus, which is always equal to that element's atomic number, and S is something called the screening constant. So what in the world is a screening constant? <sighs> well, okay, a screening constant is equal to the number of electrons found in orbitals that are lower in energy than the orbital of the electron in question. For example, if I were asked to calculate the Z effective for the valence electrons, which are the outermost electrons in fluorine, I would do the following. One, I would determine the number of protons in fluorine's nucleus, which is always equal to its atomic number, in this case, nine. That number happens to be Z from the equation I just showed you in the previous slide. Two, determine the complete electron configuration of fluorine as we've discussed in chapter six. I'll post a link to that lecture right here. For fluorine, that electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. Three, Decide which orbitals are the valence or outermost orbitals. Now these outermost orbitals, the valence orbitals, are the ones that have the highest n or principal quantum number. In the case of fluorine, the valence orbitals are the 2s and 2p orbitals. Those are the valence orbitals because they have the largest number, this 2, in front of each of them, which is larger than 1 for the 1s orbital. Four. Decide which orbitals are lower in energy than the valence orbitals. For fluorine, there's only one lower energy orbital, the 1s orbital. That orbital, by the way, the lower energy orbital, is the one that's closer to fluorine's nucleus. 
and smaller than the 2s and 2p orbitals, which are further out. Five, we now count how many total electrons there are in the lower energy orbitals. For fluorine, that happens to be two. We know that there are two electrons in the 1s orbital fluorine because it's indicated in the 1s2 part of its electron configuration. So this little two right here indicates that in the 1s orbital, that smallest spherical shaped orbital that's closest to the nucleus of fluorine, there are two electrons occupying it. That two, in this case, is the number s from the equation that I showed you in the previous slide. In step six, we now calculate the z effective using that equation, which is equal to z minus s, which for the numbers we've been given are nine minus two which equals seven. That is the z effective for an outermost electron in fluorine. Now for some more details about z effective. Um, we can also calculate z effective for inner shell electrons, just like we would for valence electrons. When doing so, the steps are the same. Z is always equal to the number of protons in the atom's nucleus, which is always the uh, particular element's atomic number. And s is the number of electrons in the orbitals that are lower in energy than that of the electron in question. Also, when calculating s, electrons in the same orbital as the electron in question don't count. They're given a value of zero. And lastly, although you probably already figured this, the larger the z effective, the more strongly an electron feels attracted to the protons in its nucleus. That takes us to a set of problems from our problem set. What value do you estimate for the z effective experienced by the outermost electron in both sodium and potassium, assuming core electrons contribute one and valence electrons contribute zero to the screening constant? And which will experience a greater effective nuclear charge, or is the effective? The electrons in the n equals 3 shell in argon, or in the n equals 3 shell in krypton? Now, although I'm not going to answer either of these questions in this video, I will post a link here to a separate video in which I do. I'd highly recommend, though, that before you watch it, you should attempt to do these on your own. That brings us to the end of this video. I hope you go ahead and watch our next one, and we shall continue discussing trends in the periodic table. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.